agenda plan for you today. And to start, I have the honor of introducing your keynote speaker, Tori Pullman. Tori, a senior director analyst in our digital workplace group, speaks to the topics of digital employee experience, or DEX, and what they like to call the future of DEX leadership. Today, Tori is going to take us through the results of their year-long research project into allyship and how you, as IT leaders, either experience or practice allyship in your careers. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Tori Pullman. Wow, thank you so much for being here. What a huge room to reach all of you. You know that saying, uh, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas? Okay, maybe you're experiencing that today. Listen, I have to let you in on a secret. I have never been more nervous than I am in this moment. And by the way, it's, it's not because I'm up here speaking in front of 4,000 people and everyone live streaming. It's because I'm up here speaking on a topic called what good allyship looks like in front of 4,000 people. You see, as a member of the LGBTQ community and as a non-binary person, sure, I tick a few boxes, but I am by no means a perfect ally. I'm afraid that I'll cultivate moments today that cause your defenses to go up and I'll have the opposite effect I'm trying to have. I'm afraid of getting it wrong in my real life. What does it mean about me if I'm up here giving a talk about what good allyship looks like and later I use the wrong language? Dr. Howard Gardner once said, stories represent the greatest and most powerful weapon in a leader's arsenal. That's why this session is all about stories. And while I'll tell you right now, Contrary to Gartner's business model, there is no expert at allyship. I did spend the last year of my life reading, researching, talking with leaders like you about their experiences and building this session quite literally for all of us. So here's my promise to each and every one of you in this room. I will not tell you how to feel or think. I won't tell you what to do. My hope is only to give you something to think about. So, let me tell you a story about my friend Aletha. When my wife and I first got married, we lived in a four-story walk-up in downtown San Francisco, and we held a housewarming party for our friends. In the first five minutes of my party, my friend Aletha called and said, hey, can you give me a hand? You see, my friend Aletha uses a wheelchair most of the time, and she uses forearm crutches some of the time. So I ran down four flights of stairs to find Aletha at the bottom of my stoop. I ran down to the stoop and I went to pick her up. Just pick her up. No asking, right? Now my friend Aletha, rightfully so, <laughs> hit me with her nearest available, uh, available forearm crutch and she said, what is wrong with you? What did I do? I, I went inside, totally lost to my thoughts of embarrassment not, it couldn't even get out of my own head about what I had done. Aletha offered me the most incredible gift. She said, Tori, ask me what I need. Wow. Every single one of us in this room needs something right in this very moment. But let me just ask you, when was the last time someone asked you what you needed? And if they did, would you even be willing to share it? You see, asking for what we need and sharing what we need is an incredibly vulnerable experience. And I think that you would all agree that it's increasingly difficult to be vulnerable in today's world. We are living in an extraordinarily and increasingly polarized world. It's a world made up of entirely binary systems. Black versus white. Men versus women. Rich versus poor. We find ourselves taking sides on everything, right? Politics, climate, human rights, even love. Debate, it's coarse. It's even less civil. 
and mistakes, what happens there? Exile from the group. You know I'm referring to cancel culture, of course. The thing about it is that if we see this world as nothing more than shifting privileges from one group to another, we prove that us versus them is a matter of survival. But polarization doesn't just put our personal lives at risk. Polarization puts our organization's ability to thrive at risk when we shift from us versus them to us versus us. Vulnerability in business means that people on your team feel comfortable raising their hand and saying, I don't know what I'm doing. I made a mistake. I need help. If you were lucky enough to be here last year when my, my colleague Mernoush unpacked the collective on hiding, then you know that we have unknowingly created a work environment where everyone comes to work every day and lies and fakes and hides. How long can your organization possibly thrive under those circumstances? But there is a solve. You can shift us from us versus us to us by unleashing the dynamic leader inside you. So let's talk about what a dynamic leader is. Dynamic leadership is defined as recognizing that there's constant change in the world, like new technologies you've been hearing about. A dynamic leader well, they're often described as having positive energy and full of new ideas. And dynamic leadership is someone who stimulates change in the world. But change is what you do. IT leaders are dynamic leaders because you are primed for change. So change is all allyship is. Now, I wonder if you remember a time when you could literally open a book and every single word in our language was written there. I would argue that that time has changed, right? New words enter our vocabulary every day. Words we don't know, like cisgender, BIPOC, neurodiverse, and if you have a teenager, more every day. Even the word allyship, though, is somewhat new. It was the word of the year in 2021, and it doesn't translate into other languages as well. So to understand what allyship is, I went to AI. I'm lying, I didn't do that. I asked leaders like you. I interviewed hundreds of IT leaders about what allyship looked like and how they would define it, and this is what I found. A pretty scrambled word cloud, right? But certain things came up time and time again. Words like empathy, change, Commitment, action. So I use those to create a definition for us today. Ally. Ideally, every single person in this room committed to that. And it means that you have committed to the foundational commitment to have empathy for lived experiences other than your own. It's pretty simple, right? But I wonder if anyone has ever been told ally is a verb. Well, that's where the ship comes in. Allyship means taking the advantages that we have, and we all have advantages in our life. We all have disadvantages too. But it means taking those advantages and using them to speak up and stand beside those who are marginalized or not in the room. So, when I'm trying to figure out what something is, I play what I call the subtraction game. What isn't it? So let's talk about what allyship isn't. It isn't something you can do for an entire group of people. You can't be successful with all black women everywhere. I can't assume that everyone that uses a wheelchair will want exactly what Aletha wants, right? But it's also not something that's the blame game. It's not something that is the responsibility of one group of people. We all have a responsibility to give and receive allyship. The 24-hour news cycle might catalyze us, but it's not something that should happen only after something bad happens. What about this? It's not a merit badge. It is something that is a foundational commitment to having the ups and downs of this journey. But I wonder if some of you are thinking this. You're thinking, well, Tori, and I heard this a lot in my interviews, when I'm trying to be an ally, it feels like I can't be friends, I can't give a hug, I can't make a joke, I can't be me when I'm walking on eggshells. But allyship isn't a barrier, it's actually an opening. 
And finally, friendship. We do not need to be friends to be an ally. When we're friends, we, we create deeper connections with people. When we're allies, we create broader equity. And of course, we can be allies to our friends, but we don't have to be friends to be allies. So now that we know what it isn't, we need to know what it feels like. Now, unlike just the interviews with IT leaders, I asked literally every single person I met this year how allyship has felt in their life. And here's what I heard. First, they amplified my voice, like when I was being spoken over in a meeting, right? Or when I was too afraid to speak out. I heard they created a team culture where my, my differences were valued, or they created a team culture where diversity existed. I heard they gave me a chance. I know my story at Gartner is all about having a chance. But the one that came up the most frequently was they took the time to listen to my story. Now, we created a social media analysis of common words used to describe allyship, and this is what we found peaks and valleys. But as we investigated the peaks closer, what we found was chatter goes up considerably when bad things are reported in the news. Well, that makes sense. Impovia did a survey of, of people, not just allies, and what they found was that 50% of the world are catalyzed to begin their journey after hearing about someone else's negative experience. This could be something you read on the news. It could be someone in your family in your friend group, in your church, someone that you met at a conference. I think I see some nods out there. I bet some of you have had this experience. You might be saying, however, I'm bought in, right? Allyship is a journey I want to take personally. But why is this important to my work? Gartner's 2022 Digital Worker Survey asked nearly 5,000 workers around the world which company executive had the most positive influence on their overall employee experience. Now, I wonder if many of you think that the CHRO was pretty high on this list. We did too. We were completely shocked to find that the CIO has more positive influence on employee experience than the CHRO and those of their teams. So, you also have an outsized talent problem. And maybe you've been learning about that this week. 35% of IT workers say that they are actively looking for a new role versus only 19 of non-IT. But when people say they have at least one ally, just one, they're two times more likely to be happy in their roles. And guess what? When they say they have an empathetic leader, they're two and a half times more likely to want to stay and more than two times more likely to be high performers. So you can have an outsized impact on your professional talent strategy by leaning into allyship as a practice. Okay, to understand what good looks like, we have to tell some stories, right? I wonder if anyone in this room can recognize what's happening in this picture. That's right, the ice bucket challenge. During the summer of 2015, one person started what would become a global viral craze to raise awareness for ALS, but also to drive donations to the ALS Foundation. Virtually overnight, ALS became a household phrase, and it felt like everybody was dumping ice cold water over their heads or donating to ALS Foundation research. Now, I didn't do the ice bucket. Did anybody in this room dump an ice bucket over their head? That's right, we got a couple. We can take care of the rest of you today if you'd like to. But what was the outcome of this viral craze? Well, let me unpack it for you. Two and a half million videos were shared on social media. Well, that happens every day, right? But this resulted in a 187% increase in donations to the ALS Foundation to the tune of $220 million, which funded 322 new research grants. So you see, one person can start a change if they match their message to their platform. You can be those people. Now you have honed your successful skills of empathy to understand business problems, right? And to understand the capabilities of the people on your team. You have set direction for your teams, even by coming here today. 
to take bold, decisive, and courageous action. The good news is that action and empathy are exactly what allies use to create broader equity. So all throughout this presentation today, we're going to use these two qualities of your successful leadership to understand your path forward. But first, we have to understand the kinds of states we might find ourselves in. Impovia also found that 5% of the world are what they called active deniers of allyship. Now, they defined this as people who say, literally, they see no injustices, no inequalities, and no exclusion in the world. I think we can agree it'd be pretty difficult to see that, so you'd really want to see it if that's your point of view. Now, the 95% of the rest of us, and I know it's the rest of us in this room, just might find ourselves in different states at different times. So let's unpack that. At the beginning, we're likely to be disengaged. Maybe we're just not even taking any action, right? As we get more engaged, we build more empathy, we, we gather more stories, but we're maybe a little bit more passive in our actions that we take. But sometimes we can become a bit performative. It can be difficult to see what, you know, really who's benefiting from our actions. And in this state of being a performer, we're likely to cause unintended harm. And then finally, the unicorns, right? These are people who are actively dismantling, breaking the cycles of discrimination all day long. Now, I know that I wrote this, and this was the first version of this, but something didn't work for me. I want to, I'm going to come back over here and tell you what didn't work for me. It, it, it really implies that our willingness to take action and our ability to empathize, will they grow at the same rate over our life? But we know that's not true, and I promise you, you know, no matter how committed you are to this work, you're going to find yourself in different states, on different days, on different topics. So I'm wondering if you might be willing to build something with me. So let's clear the page. All right. So now let's imagine that our willingness to take action is our y-axis, okay? And now let's imagine that our ability to empathize is the x-axis. I don't know how we're going to make 4,000 co-authors for this, but we're going to try this. So if we do it like that, right, this allows us to see that our ability to be an ally is directly related to our proportional willingness and ability to empathize throughout our lives. So if this is true, that just means that disengaged allies just have a lower ability to empathize and don't take as much action. Maybe they just haven't been catalyzed yet. Okay, so then as we move over into the passive box, right, we've all been here. We've all been here. We've seen something. We saw someone respond. We felt empathy. But for whatever reason, we didn't take action. Maybe we didn't know what to do. Okay, so now let's come over here. Now we're in the performer box, right? Sometimes we take action without really thinking it through. Like my friend Aletha. And finally, the magic happens. When our willingness to take action and our ability to empathize happen with people we can really empathize with. Can you tell what we did here? We have introduced Gartner's newest magic quadrant for allyship. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so what do we need to make a magic quadrant complete? We need critical capabilities. So again, using your critical capabilities, what does this look like? Well, for empathy, it means listening to people without judgment, even yourself, and learning without needing to be taught by people, okay? On the action side, it means connecting with people in a meaningful way and amplifying the voices of those on the margins. So if we look at it that way, simply what we find is that we're, when we're disengaged, we just haven't built those capabilities or even maybe had those opportunities. Now, as I interviewed IT leaders that had found themselves disengaged, I found three barriers to engagement. Let's walk through those. The first is intent. Has anyone ever heard this phrase, microaggressions? What well, came up a lot in my interviews. Now, microaggressions are defined as being rooted in underlying biases, and they, they exhibit stereotypes, right? And they're often hidden in 
maybe jokes, good humor, they're not typically intended to be harmful. But the folks I interviewed who expressed their microaggressions said that they accompany people from the moment they wake until the moment they fall asleep, from the day that they're born until the day that they die. What really struck me in my interviews, though, was that people said, you know, Tori, they don't feel all that micro to us when they're happening. So some, let me tell you some of the ones I heard. I interviewed a man named Jose. Jose said he has often said, wow, you speak so well. But you know what I said to Jose is, you look like someone who would speak English with an accent. I spoke with Rajesh. Rajesh said that he is frequently asked, where are you really from? Now, born and raised in California. He said it, it says to him, you look like someone that doesn't belong. Solochina, female engineering leader. She told me that she has often asked, do you have a nickname we can use in place of your name? Which to her sounds a lot like, your name is hard for me to pronounce, and I don't really want to put in the effort to learn it. But this one, this one goes out to all the ladies in the room. Julie. <laughs> Julie said all throughout her career, she has been asked to take notes at meetings. And she's now an executive. She said, when this happens, Tori, what we're really saying is, we just don't value your contributions as much. Now, these were so impactful for me, in part because I'd said some of them. Where are you really from, right? So I said, okay, well, what should we do? And they said, let's commit to micro affirmations. Jose said, compliment me on the substance. Jose, that was a really, really great point you made, really great argument. Okay, well, when we're trying to create connections, ask, where, are you, where do you call home? Solochina said, if someone just said to me, Solochina, can you help me practice your name once? And then I promise, I'll go off and practice it on my own. And Julie said, communicate a state of equity. If you take notes today, I'll take them next week. The second barrier, though, is motivation. And <laughs> let me offer a uh, suggestion. There are some things that are nearly laws of human behavior. The difference between something we should do and something we want to do is all about motivation. How many people have a bag of spinach in their fridge right now? OK. When we, obligation can only motivate some people some of the time. And obligation is what we use when we're trying to advance DE&I initiatives and, frankly, enterprise change, right? But it's going to work exactly the way we expect it to. Some people will, some of the time. But inspiration, it invites us to a positive experience. Inspiration is so much more powerful than obligation. Inspiration can motivate most of us most of the time. You see, when we're, we feel obligated, we focus on what we should or shouldn't do. But when we feel inspired, we see possibilities. Let me tell you a story about inspiration. I've been with Gartner for about three years. And the day before I joined, I was really nervous. I mean, we're all nervous, right? When we start a new job, will they like me? Will I fit in? Am I smart enough? That's a big one at Gartner. But I was more nervous than most people, I think. Because as a non-binary person, I wasn't sure how well I would be received. Now, I didn't expose my identity during the interview process. So let me tell you, I was absolutely shocked by the email I received by my, from my boss the day before I joined. He's a man of few words. It literally said, Dear Tori, please let me know which bio below you would like me to use. Now, I scrolled to the bottom of the email, and I almost I was scratching my head. I couldn't see the difference between these two bios. Well, it turns out that my new boss had gone out to my LinkedIn profile. He had found that I was on the board of directors of a nonprofit. He went to that uh, website. I think you could call this doxing, too. But he went to that website. He read the bio. He discovered that I had used they, them pronouns in that bio. He wrote two bios, my professional experience, my expertise, my hobbies and simply two versions with pronouns. He offered me a choice. Now, I want to tell you that this was an easy choice, but it wasn't. And I want to tell you that I've never regretted it, but sometimes I have. 
But that's the risk we take with allyship. Now, I accepted his, his inspiration, but when I was writing this talk, I went back to him and I said, Hans, what was the meaning behind this email? He said he was inspired by what he found on that volunteer page. He said, Tori, if I could write the intent of that email, it was simply, a new job is a new start. Please let me know how much of your authentic self you'd like to bring to work. The third, and I think biggest barrier that I found is fear. You know, during my interviews, one thing jumped out. We are terrified of getting it wrong in our lives. Here are some of the things I heard. I'm afraid of looking like a bad ally or being patronizing, like my story with Aletha. I heard cancel culture more times than I can count. I'm afraid that if I do something wrong, I'm gonna put my reputation or that of my business at risk. I heard, huh, you know what, Tori? I don't stick out on a regular basis. Why? Why would I put myself in that position? Going against my peers is really hard, especially as an IT leader, as you're trying to get, get folks on your side. And finally, I heard, I think there's just more risk in getting it wrong than there is in doing nothing. But we're not alone. Nearly half of senior IT leaders say that they are deeply concerned about their reputation should they mishandle a sensitive issue. But the thing about fear is that we're really not that objective when it's happening, right? I'll tell you a personal story. I am terrified of the ocean, like terrified of the ocean. But when we went on a cruise and my nine-year-old said, my darling nine-year-old said, the only thing she wanted to do was swim with sea turtles, I told myself, no problem, I can do that. It wasn't until I jumped off a perfectly good boat past the coastline of Mexico that I realized this was gonna be a problem and I needed to be saved. Understanding our default relationship to fear is the beginning of our journey of allyship. Do we react with flight, right? We avoid conflict and we wanna preserve harmony. If that's true, we might say, ah, I'll start when I know it'll be perfect and no one will be mad at me. Is our default response freeze? That's me, right? We'll do this when someone tells us exactly the right perfect way to do it. As soon as HR tells us what to do, we'll start. Do we value logic over empathy? In that case, we might say, we're IT. We're not HR or DE&I. This is not our role to do. So how does fear impact our ability to be creative, open-minded, great decision makers? And I already said, I set you up. You are those people, you're in this room. When you experience fear, your amygdala is activated. Now, this part of your brain processes information at 250,000 times the rate of the rational brain, which is good. When you experience shame, like being called a bad ally, right? Your insula is activated and you feel physical threat and pain. You get sweaty. The good news is, this is really good if you're being chased by a bear or you're trying to lie to your spouse about what you did in Las Vegas. But the bad news is that it's physically impossible for you to be the creative, open-minded, great decision makers that you are. So why did Dr. Howard Gardner say that stories represent the most powerful weapon in a leader's arsenal? Stories help us create bonds. They activate our positive memories. But more importantly, they release a chemical called oxytocin. Oxytocin, it insulates our brain from the experiences of fear and shame. And guess what? The more oxytocin we have in our body, the more generous and open-minded we become. Earlier today, I told you that Impovia said that 50% of the world begins their journey after hearing about a negative story. I believe that we can be called to action by stories. I believe that 100% of us can be called to action by positive stories too, like the one I just told you about, my boss Hans. So, these are the recommendations when we find ourselves in that disengaged box. Seek out stories, podcasts, 
books, lived experiences. If every single one of the people in this room just told their story to one other person, we would be a false multiplier in the 10,000s. If you want a book list, come to me. I have a book list. But when we're taking action, we have to think about our fear, right? I told you, I was in a frozen place. You can't begin your journey. So thinking about your default to action to fear, or your default reaction to fear, and what you can do about it is the first stage of your journey. Okay. But what about those that are passive, right? We, means we have a higher degree of empathy, but we don't take action all the time, or maybe our action is very quiet. Let me tell you about Edwin. Edwin told me about being on a panel for Grace Hopper Celebration. He was talking with young women early in their career, and the moderator turned to him and said, what advice would you give women who are growing their career? Edwin took a second and said, this is not my lived experience, and he pivoted to someone else on the panel. You see, being passive doesn't need to be bad. But maybe another story. During my interview with a woman named Michelle, she said, Tori, if we were walking down the street and someone used a racial slur about me, who's a black woman, what would you do? I paused immediately. It had not occurred to me to have an answer for this type of question, particularly in an interview. And so I said what came most authentically. I said, I think that I would probably react with anger and yell back. Michelle immediately said, is that what you think I want you to do? My insula was activated. I began to flush immediately on camera. It was very, very visible. And like Aletha, Michelle saved me. She said, Tori, allyship happens in the before. Allyship means that we need to learn what someone would want us to do. So here are our recommendations for when we find ourselves in the passive spot. The first is, go back to Aletha, go back to Michelle. In one-on-one -on -one interactions with people that you have real relationships with, ask them what they would want or not want you to do on their behalf. And when you begin to take action, have courageous conversations with your peers. Begin to create opportunities in your team to address microaggressions and to address challenges as they come up. But we hear a lot about performative allyship, right? The performative ally is showing high action, low empathy. Now, actually, performative allyship is often the result of the fourth fear response, which is, to call, is, which is called to fawn. Now, when we fond, we seek approval for our actions. We post something on LinkedIn, and then we check for all the likes and reshares. We also act outwardly at the expense of honest progress. And this can be the most threatening state to authentic allyship. So my favorite example, though, of performative allyship is Blackout Tuesday. Any Instagram folks in the house here? OK. Blackout Tuesday started with the best intentions. The move was to post a black square to one's Instagram page, to black out your Instagram uh, page, uh, to show solidarity with the way that structural racism was impacting black Americans. But unlike the ALS bucket challenge, it actually had no real action to be taken on the back of it. And many, many, many people and organizations were accused of slacktivism. Researchers at Bentley, by the way, studied the impact of Blackout Tuesday. They categorized organizations into three buckets. Bucket number one, they blacked out, they, they participated in the campaign, and they also took action, like uh, donating money. Bucket number two, they participated in the campaign but had no diversity in their leadership group. And bucket number three, they didn't participate in the campaign. What they found was bucket number one, the authentic allies, showed better stock performance at both the one mark and the three mark after the campaign. So here are our recommendations for when we find ourselves in a performative space, and we will. Inventory the actions that you or your organization take to support or recruit marginalized people. Ask yourself, who's really benefiting from this? But for action that you can take literally today, 
inventory the actions that you take and ensure that your organization is offering foundational support, like Maslow's foundation, support for access to, to affirming healthcare, access to parenting journeys, access to career paths. Now, near the end of my interview with Wesley, I think he tried to rename my talk. He said, Tori, the longer we've talked, <laughs> the more I think good is not good enough. But he's not alone. In the book Good to Great, Jim Collins said that good is the enemy of great. He went on to say that greatness is really just about a conscious choice and discipline, and this is what champion allies get right. What I heard from these folks were not they were champions all the time, but they had had these moments. So let's talk about Rich. Rich is a CISO, and as he was beginning his security career, he engaged more and more with professional social media. And what he found was there were no women in these professional social media circles. So he immediately started at mentioning women to bring them into the conversation. But almost as immediately, Rich was called out by a black woman to say he was only at mentioning white women. Now you're probably having the same physical response as Rich. He was trying to do the right thing, right? Here he is being criticized. But Rich took a deep breath, he set aside his ego, and he leaned in and asked her help for, for, for her help growing his network. Now, Rich has had incredible success with this. He has built a security team that is made up of more than 80% underrepresented minorities, so an incredibly diverse team. But he also said he uses it in his personal lives. He's a very successful CISO now, so he's asked frequently to sit on panels. He calls them manals. He has refused to sit on industry panels that are not diversified, and he uses his network he built 10 years ago to bring new and diverse voices into those communities. To understand how organizations can have success the way Rich is, we look to Santander Bank. Santander did what most of us do, a review of our ethnicity data at our senior leadership. And what they found was a significant underrepresented uh, number of black talent at their most senior positions. They interviewed young black talent to ask why. Why are, are people leaving? And the young black talent said, well, we see no path forward for us. There's nobody up there to aspire to. So Santander created a program called Accelerating You, the Black Talent Program. Now, this program is available to, to uh, associates in all parts of their business, both front office and back office. And what they get is 40 hours of professional development delivered entirely by inspiring black role models. Santander goes way beyond mentorship by focusing on allyship with three key aspects. The first, the importance of advocacy. The second, the importance of building an empowered circle and network of peers and, and uh, mentors around you. And the third, on the importance of career trajectory boosting sponsorship. Santander has already begun to expand their Accelerating You program to employees from various backgrounds. But we talked about motivation. <laughs> Microsoft realized that their data-driven workforce needed something that was more scientific. So they hired neuroscientists and worked with them for two years to create what they called the Microsoft Allyship Program. Now, Microsoft Program offers 10 modules that are both self-paced but also facilitated. And they offer it to all 200,000 and growing employees around the world. They have brought it down to six key tenants. Tenant number one, they combat unconscious bias by practicing what they call willful awareness. I love that. They, they slow down. They suspend judgment. They listen. They get curious. They ask good questions and listen intently to the responses. They focus on the impact that the action has had, not always only on the intent. They believe in speaking for, not sorry, speaking up, not speaking for other people. And finally, they embrace mistakes. They recognize that mistakes are a big part of the process. So let's get back in our time machine and go back to 2008, the scene of one of my mistakes. Now remember, I froze, completely lost in my thoughts of embarrassment, right? 
I bet many of, all, many of you can recall a time when you've made a mistake like this. You might even be getting a little sweaty on my behalf. So let me ask you, when we make a mistake, what do we want? What do we want out of that moment? We want out of the moment. We want to move on and get on with our lives and try to improve it. And that is exactly what Bob of Clark County, Nevada told me. He said, before helping other people with their mistakes, I've got to, I've got to focus on my own mistakes. He did this by creating an allyship agreement for his IT department. Now he said, he has to make it safe for people to make mistakes. So this agreement focuses on two things. First, I will be open to additional insight when I make a mistake, and I'm willing to tell you when you make a mistake. But the second part I think is even more powerful. He helps employees pre-plan what they'll do when they make a mistake. We pre-plan conversations with our doctor, with our boss, with our spouse. Now, Bob said that he says, I will apologize without making an excuse. Or as he said, I, say, I live by six words, thank you for letting me know. We're near the end of my conversation with Michelle, though. I said, hey, is learning to recover gracefully a key aspect of being an ally? And she said, no. She said, listen, Tori, when, allyship, when you're engaging in authentic allyship, it's not about you. You're putting your needs, your instincts, your desires, your ego aside. She went on to say, if you could get it right 99% of the time and get it wrong 1% of the time, and if you focused on that 1% of time, it would be an act of ego. She said, focus on letting go. Now, Every interview I had, people said this in a slightly different way, right? Sometimes the best intentions have bad results. Wes called it clumsy things from a place of caring. Bob told us these, these, these should be opportunities to capture where you are going and learn and move on. Michelle said it best. She said, Tori, sorry plus action it equals progress. Ultimately, the hallmark of a champion ally is not that they get it right all of the time. It's also not that they undergo some sort of personality transplant while they're here in this room. They're committed. They're committed to make deliberate choices that show this as an important value in their life and in their leadership in a way that other people can see. They're intentional. They take intentional action to include those who are not in the room. Ask yourself, who's not in this room right now? Place a chair in every room you make a decision. Identify who's not in that room. And finally, they recognize that even though it isn't perfect and sometimes it's never enough, they follow through to see that unintentional harm is repaired and acknowledged. So, as we close out today, I want to leave you with one last thought. I wanted to play a song, but it turns out it costs about $7 trillion to license this song. Uh, but uh, the team did not tell me I couldn't hum it. So that's, a, that's special for you. I want you to think about what's happening in this movie when this song is playing. Ready? What's happening? It's Rocky. It's running, yep. It's like every music montage you've ever seen in a movie. The character is failing over and over and over and over and over again until they finally find a way to get it right. I wish that I could inoculate all of you in this room, in this moment, to fail fast, the way that perhaps you've learned to do in your IT career. But here's the thing. Experimentation, iteration, and failure, they are the cultural hallmarks of all-star innovators. Remember I promised you at the beginning, I won't tell you how to feel or think. I won't tell you what to do. My hope was only to give you something to think about. And so, 
In the next few moments, you'll walk out of all of these beautiful doors right here for the rest of your life. And we may never, ever meet again. My hope for you is that you will take this opportunity to recognize that the world is changing. That you will find the courage in your belly to let it change you. And I don't make promises lightly, but I absolutely promise you that if you do that, you, every one of you, will change the world. Thank you.